son, autonomous, excuse me, son of Jabal or Jubal. Uh, whoever forges implements of bronze or metal is Tubal Cain himself. So today's title is Forged in Fire. And when you think of that, I know some people, like Caleb says, well, isn't there a TV show called Forged in Fire? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but they came along later. And when I think of Forged in Fire, I usually think of a caveman. You ever have that picture in your mind where they're like, we came from cavemen and we had to learn to build fire. And the story was always around fire. Well, when we go back in the Bible, to be able to make bricks, you need heat. Heat needed in kilns or brick to make iron or steel mold and shape so it becomes a process. Metal, brick, and gold, things you must be an artificer in. And so weapons and idols, authority, seasoned of Cain, absorbed in his way, because in some translations it will render seasoned. And we know what seasoned is, you know, you're made to be prepared or prepared well. And he was seasoned, of course, by the ones that came before him. What would these things bring to the lives of the antediluvians is the question. The ability to make such things, because the story goes so fast. You don't really readily keep up with what God is actually telling you about what is going on and what has happened. But one of the things that can come from the ability of such things is war, taking by force or even defending. But who is our defense? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, but these were not those who would follow God's way. They had their own laws, their own rules, and basically went in defiance against God. The myths of fire and the things that they did with fire as make weapons has gone through all different times as and different societies. You have the axe, the sword in Asian culture is actually believed to have a spirit within it. So they attributed these things to samurai um, with their swords. You have the Roman sword, um, I guess the, the, the weapons changing throughout time. Uh, the Romans were going against Hannibal and they were actually beating him. And it was basically because of the way they had changed up their weapons. They had a short sword. So rolling gladius was about, what, maybe four inches and long, and it would cut about four inches. And then you had the 15-pound sword made by the Swiss and the Germans. And when I had thought about that sword, because you're going through different times and different ages and different people, the Bible also goes through different times, to different ages and different people. And we don't attribute things to people, but as we said, they were the father of. So when these things are passed on, you look around and you say, well, who is still able to make such things? And so instantly when I thought of that Swiss German sword and how big it was, you know, it was, it was huge. I thought of Goliath because the Bible describes Goliath and his weapons. So we go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 3 through 11. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 3 through 11. I know sometimes it takes time to find that one, but I will start by reading in verse, let's go with two. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountainside on, the side, on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was about 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs 
and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. So he didn't even carry his own shield unless needed. But it was a big shield, I guess. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? And ye, servants of Saul, choose ye a man for you and let him come down to me. So, like I said, these stories go fast, and we may not understand what all was just said, but that was a lot, especially in translating it from the Hebrew to English. And so it went through the description of what Goliath was wearing. It told you how many shekels of iron and brass they had alone. Now, how did he come? To have so much. Oh, is that the phone? <laughs> Sorry about that. And where did they get it from? He says to them, am I not a Philistine? What does that mean? Well, we're going to continue on. And for you guys who just came, 1 Samuel 17, 3 through 11 is where we're at. Now... We get down here to verse 8, and I'll read it again. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? And ye servants of Saul. That right there, he's stating something that he's not completely letting us in on what he knows. But we will as we continue to read. Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. What made them afraid? What? Well, was it what was being said, necessarily, that made him afraid? Or was it what they possessed? Fighting, war, and the threat of slavery. As I've said before, Goliath was believed to be a slave as well. So why would he give this proposition if it wasn't something that had been going on already? We know that Nimrod made slaves of men, but how? Through war. So this had been going on even before then. And we can even fast forward to the days of the gladiators, right? Were they free or were they slaves? Slaves. So how had they become slaves? You see, these stories start to come together through time because they ring the sound of similarity. And how did some gain freedom? If you were a gladiator, how'd you gain your freedom? Right? You had to fight. You had to kill for gain and for lucre. People were making bets and placing bets. You became a favorite of someone, then they sponsored you, right? And if you won them enough money and enough battles and fights, you were able to become free, right? Isn't that what took out the Romans? Slaves, right? How many slaves did they have in Rome? <laughs> More slaves than they had people. <laughs> so we'll continue on, but we're going to drop down to 32. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. 
You hear this? You guys hear this story going, right? Saul is like, no, no. And Saul is the king of Israel. He says, no, no, you're but a boy. This guy has been a soldier. He's been doing this since he was a kid. And David said, well, you know, there was a bear and a lion that came and took the lamb. He didn't say it was trying to take the lamb. He said it was in their mouth. <laughs> now that tells you David had some type of courage to take it out of him. Have you had a pet, even a dog, you know, and you try to take something out of his mouth? Because dogs like that, right? They'll pull on the sock and you're pulling on the sock. They'll pull on the bone. You're pulling on the bone and they're, arr, arr. they do the growl and everything, right? Imagine that with a lion or a bear. <laughs> so some people like to tell the story and, and take away the grandeur by saying, well, maybe it was a, maybe it was a small youthful lion or something. Well, me and my imagination, I make it bigger, you know, because that's who God is to me. You know, he does great things. And so David explains what's going on here. And in 37, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with you. Us people that study the Bible understand symbolism as well. And here it is, David saying, well, he's taking me out of the paw of a lion, out of a paw of the bear. And we know these kingdoms would come to rule, right? Which symbolize the bear, which symbolize the lion. And then there's a leopard, right? So I thought that was kind of cool because it started to put my mind there. But I tried to stay focused and stay on the story. So I dropped down to 38 and saw armed David with his armor and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. Now, what's going on here? Why is Saul giving David his own armor, right? Usually, if you're going to take something off and give it to someone and it's your own, why are you doing that? It's, they probably don't have one, right? Okay, but isn't David just a boy and Saul a man, as he was saying? He was tall. You remember how, how tall they said he was. So was this armor going to fit? But what was Saul doing it for? He obviously knew that it wasn't going to fit. But in his mind, he was getting David prepared in a way that he would prepare. Because we know that Saul and his sons had armor. But did the rest of Israel? So we continue with the story. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go. For he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. Now, I love that. Why? Because I, I know the story. I know where I'm going with it. So I smile now. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of a brook or a river. And he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So here we see the story develop. Who has weapons and who does it? Why do the Philistines have weapons and Israel does it? We know Saul has armor and his sons, but do you hear of anyone else having armor or weapons? So what's, what's going on here? God's people use different weapons. They had not the ability to make and to forge weapons. Mm. Well, if we go back to the story of Lamech and Tubal-Cain in Genesis, we repeat that Zilla, she bare Tubal-Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. So the ability to make weapons had come way before the Philistines. And it was a certain way and a certain people that were able to make these weapons. You would need to know how first, right? You would have to mix some things. And his sister Natalie said, I believe that in forging, you have to 
learn to mix things to be able to forge them and to be able to make it. And oil, I believe, was one of the things that they would use. And where would they get it from? I don't know. I think they said something about snails and different things like that. But as Sister Natalie was speaking of the story in the, the uh, children's story, I thought that that was really cool that she had mentioned that because it was a part of the process. So the ability to make and forge weapons did what David said about him and the lion and the bear sink in to Saul. And if it had, why would Saul give him his armor? It hadn't sunk in. But wasn't Saul the first king of Israel? Right? God had chosen him. But obviously, this is speaking to Saul's demeanor, his personality. Why? David just told him this grand story. Wouldn't the first thing Saul give him is three slings and maybe a bunch of rocks? You know, as opposed to giving him armor? So... We do not know that Saul and his, well, let's see. We'll drop down to verse 46. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the hosts of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. What did David understand? Something that God's people had grown up accustomed to. He hadn't tried the armor, so he wasn't comfortable in it. But what had he tried? The Lord. And what did the Lord give him to defend himself? Things that could not be polluted, right? Can you? He says, when you build an altar unto me, you take those stones and you put it on there, but you don't let your tool touch it. Why? It's already perfect. As soon as you mess with it, it becomes tainted. And so it came to pass in 48, when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. What type of battle is being portrayed here? You have this little ruddy kid, what, maybe 17? You know, Caleb. <laughs> Call Caleb out, right? You have Caleb running towards this giant, right? And he is with his army. It doesn't say he ran towards just Goliath. He ran towards the army to meet them with just what he had. Speaks of his courage and the things that maybe we should do when we know God's way as opposed to the world's way. And in 49, and David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face on the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and the men of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the, and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sherium and unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. So what happened? We've seen this before happen in the Bible later and before, but what happened in this instance? You remember everyone was scared. They were afraid. They were trembling. They didn't know what to do. Now here comes David running out. Just picture him running out with just that sling and running towards the army, right? 
Goliath says what he has to say. David says what he has to say. But in the end, he ends up killing Goliath and taking his armor back to his tent. And the rest of Israel spoiled their tents. So in the Bible, we see wars and battles where even angels participated and took out armies. Um, and the Israelites did what? Went back and picked up the spoils, but they also armed themselves. So they didn't have to make it at all. Did they even know how to make it? You never know. Maybe they did. Like Brother Lau said, maybe the powers that be kept them from having weapons. You know, isn't that what Gideon said? You know, a lot of times they just didn't have weapons, but they didn't know the way. So we go to 1 Samuel 31. 1 Samuel chapter 31. And there we're going to go through verse 3 and 5. We're speaking on armor and the use of it, those who had it, those who did it, and why and what does armor have to do with fire, right? How do you make it? It's forged in fire, isn't it? You've seen the TV show. So here in 1 Samuel 31, 3 through 5, it says, And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him. And he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took his sword and fell upon it. And his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead. He fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. Saul, thinking he was doing an honorable thing by falling on a sword, was not a new thing and has taken root in many kingdoms across the world. As I mentioned the samurai before, what would a samurai do or a king do or someone in power in Asia that has feels they need to die in honor? They will cut themselves, right? You've seen it. I mean, if you haven't, you can look it up in history. So what is this evil of falling on your sword or killing yourself with this weapon that was forged out of fire? The Asian, hmm. When the Philistines had killed Saul, what did they do? In 1 Samuel 31, we drop down 8 through 10. And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head. And he stripped off his armor and sent it to the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtoreth and they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shan. What's going on here? What, what does it have to do? Mm -hmm. David took the armor. He, mm hmm. Yeah. 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 Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. So is there a similarity? Is there a similarity here? They cut Saul's head off, right? Took his armor, showed it around. Right? And then put it in the temple with their gods who? Ashtoreth, right? So what is going on with this armor? David cut off Goliath's head, and he took the armor and put it in his tent. Later on, as David was uh, fleeing from Saul, where was his sword at? Where was the sword of Goliath at? Yes, it was. What's going on here with this armor? We go back. Who's making the armor? Is it not a certain seed, right, of Tubal Cain? So how do you make the armor? What is he an artificer of? Brass, iron. What else can you make besides weapons? Especially back then and then in the antediluvian days. Jewelry. 
What did God say as you mince and you walk around with your jewelry, right? When he was with Abraham, he said, tell them, take all that stuff off, right? So what else can you make? Can you make idols? So what good is coming from these things that Tubal Cain is able to make? And what made you think he was making things of good when he came from Lamech and Cain? You see, the way wasn't just a way of acting. It was a way of going against God. And God said, thou shall not kill, right? Back to the SDA, SDA and the SDA reform. We don't believe in killing, period. I don't care if it's to free all the black people. I said it. I don't care. God said, vengeance is mine. And we heard David repeat it. So therefore, there is a difference. Why? David said, I'm going to go this way. And the world may go this way. But we have choices. And what we choose to do with that is up to us. And so in Samuel, the battle had gone sore. And they had done these things. And it says, well, they took it and they put it where their God is. As what? as pride, as, as a memorial, or as what? But for some reason, this armor has something to do with that same way. And I believe as Saul relied on his armor as opposed to God, you see the difference in David where David is like, well, I have not tried that. I've tried this, and it has worked with these things, so I'm sure it's going to work with this. And it did, and he did kill Goliath, and they were able to take everything and to arm themselves. But in Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, go to Leviticus 10, 1 through 3. And it says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. What is that about? Well, they made fire, right? But what's going on here? Maybe if we think back to Cain and Abel, what went on there? Right? God had set up a way. Abel was like, okay, I'll follow your way. Cain says what? But do it my own way. Okay. Did they have fire? Did they? We don't know, right? Or do we? Because it didn't say it. Mm. How? Okay. So it said that God was pleased, right? With Abel's offering, how did he show he was pleased? He lit it on fire. Ah. When they were trying to do the worship with Elijah, <laughs> the Baal worshipers, didn't Asherah show up too? Right? She had her priestess there too. What was their service like? Okay. With what? An instrument that was made by... Ah, okay. And they had their idol who was Baal and Ashtoreth. Okay. And what did they do? Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, this, oh, that. Okay, they're cutting themselves. You have all these things going on for hours and hours. Elijah says, what? Maybe your God can't hear you because the things that you're doing that he has sent you to do isn't working. But I'll tell you what, you go ahead, dig a trench in my mind, right? Made his own altar. Dig the trench. Pour water on it. Do Pour more water on it. And what did he do? Prayed. A simple prayer sent fire down from where? Heaven. From heaven. And what did it burn up? Everything. Everything. You see? 
So then you go back, and it's a strange fire. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh to me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Is fire a part of satanic worship? If you don't know, it's okay. Let's go. Well, we're always back there. Let's go forward. Bohemian Grove. Anyone heard of that place? Mm hmm. Bohemian Glo Grove is what? Meeting, right? Secret meeting. Government officials and different people, ex presidents and people that, yeah, corporations and things. And then what do they do? They come with these plans on how they're going to influence society, right? And you've had people sneaking into this place and revealing pictures and things like that. What's the picture that shocked everyone? Picture of a stone owl, big stone owl, and fire. And everyone dressed as women and men and different things and dancing around it and worshiping and sacrifices. So if it has nothing to do with anything, why are they still doing it today? It definitely has something to do with it. So the fire, the worship, and everything, as we see here, they offered a strange fire. Do we know exactly how or what it was? No. Why? Because it wasn't our way. So God did what he had to do. Now, about this fire, because things have been forged in fire, whether it be weapons or idols. Aaron and the procession for the sins of Israel, the golden calf, the things that were going on there. What, what did you see? When they came out of Israel and they built that golden calf, it could have been one, it could have been two, who knows, right? What happened? Moses said, there's a what? Noise coming from the camp. What kind of noise? What was going on? Ah, Joshua said what? Thought it was? War. What kind of sounds does war have opposed to a party? totally different, right? Or is it? Depends on what type of party you're having. Didn't we say in Elijah they were cutting themselves? Okay, so do you think that was something new? Something they just learned? Okay, so then what were they doing here where Moses is coming back with the commandments and they've began to worship this idol? And when asked, Aaron says what? I threw stuff in, and this came out. I don't know how it happened. It could have came out as a duck, right? It could have came out as an elephant, but it came out as a calf. Why? All right. Hear, O Israel, is your gods when Jeroboam caused Israel to sin. So, is fire a part of satanic worship? It can be, right? And it has been used for it. But now look at this. Like you said, to offer sacrifice to God, which he had already started, the fire came from God, the same way that it did with Elijah. You ever hear that saying, you're, you're, you're playing with fire? <laughs> what does that saying mean? <laughs> You're getting too close, right? It takes bricks to build a city, doesn't it? How do you make the bricks? Don't the bricks have to be heated up and things like that? So these things get to be passed down. And Cain built a city. So how many bricks did he heat up, right? And Lamech in Cain's line, here, here's their attributes. I mean, they're an artificer and this, an artificer and that. And then it ends with a daughter being born named Naamah, which means, as I've said, from older dictionaries and things, pleasure. Hmm. It isn't hitchy yet, right? All these different things that these kids were bringing, adding to what Cain had already done, and the last one has pleasure. So we go back to the beginning to see these things, and I think we need to continue to look at our Bible 
to break down strongholds of understanding and understand the way that we're going to be working and we're going to be operating and see these things in the Bible as they are today. Not only just then, God was working out a way for David. God was working out a way for Elijah. God is working out a way for us. But we have to rely on him. Forged with the love of God, our defender, our sword, is the word of truth. Forged by the Holy Spirit of God to bring down strongholds and protect the righteous on the path and way to Jesus Christ. So if you're going to be using fire, we don't need to use it for anything else but ourselves. You know, so that we may be tried true and that he may make us into what he has created us to be is my prayer that we continually not look to the world and their ways of seeing things, understanding things, or even making things in a way to get along and that we continually use the most powerful thing God has given us is prayer. And then with that prayer, he can spark a soul. What did, what did one of the prophets say? There's a, there's a fire in my bones. Huh? Y'all remember that? There's a fire in my bones. And it just keeps me having to speak of the glory of God and the things that's going on. I can't even hold it in. That's my prayer, is that we be filled with that fire. We're going to end the service. We're going to close with hymn number 494. Hymn number 494 in closing. And now you can see the reason we sang the two songs before. Onward, Christian soldiers and, you know, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. Hymn number 494 in closing. <clears throat> 